and welcome everybody to our live book event, virtual book event with uh, John Nichols coming up in just a minute. I want to welcome you all to uh, the offices of the Progressive Magazine here in Madison, Wisconsin. And um, thank you all for coming out tonight. Also, I want to thank A Room of One's Own Bookstore here in Madison, Wisconsin, that is hosting this event. And A Room of One's Own, of course, independent local bookstore, now located on Madison's east side. And uh, we appreciate all their support in hosting a number of these events that we've done over the past uh, year or so in this time of uh, coronavirus pandemic. The Progressive Magazine has a brand new issue just out and uh, should be on the newsstands and in your mailboxes within the coming week. It features a very extensive investigation by editor Bill Leaders into uh, a shocking story of seniors being evicted from their uh, care facilities. And so you'll be able to read all about that and uh, hear more about that from Bill in the coming uh, weeks as well. I encourage you, if you're not uh, familiar with The Progressive, to check out our website at progressive.org on, uh, on the internet, and you can read our articles there. We have daily content that's put up on the web uh, fresh every day of the week, and we also have uh, magazine content that is put up regularly. We have two projects that we do as well, uh, Progressive Perspectives, which places op-eds on the editorial pages of newspapers around the country, and the Public Schools Advocate, which brings us stories about what's happening in the uh, the attack on public education in this country, the attempts to privatize publication, public education, and how uh, people are fighting back against that. So you can check all that out on our website at progressive.org. Also, if you want to support the Progressive Magazine, uh, we very graciously accept your donations. We're a 501c3 nonprofit. And tonight, if you go to this address, progressive.org slash book dash event, you can uh, get a copy of John Nichols' brand new book and uh, with a donation to the Progressive. And John will also sign that book for you in the uh, coming weeks. So uh, please do that as well. Well, now I'm going to welcome uh, onto the screen with me here, um, Bill Leaders, editor of the Progressive Magazine, and also John Nichols. And I'm going to uh, say I'm very pleased to have both of you here with us tonight. I'm going to disappear off the screen, but I will leave, uh, I will leave this in uh, both of your capable hands. We'll come back at the end to do questions if people want to chat a question either on Facebook or on YouTube. We'll be... Uh, reading those questions and getting answers from our panel of guests tonight. Okay, thank you, Norm. Well, John's new book is called Coronavi Coronavirus Criminals and Pandemic Profiteers, Accountability for Those Who Caused the Crisis. John, I believe you told me this is about your dozen, uh, a dozen books that you have written, which is four times more than me. Uh, I haven't read all your books. I've read a few. I, the book that this reminds me uh, the most of is your second last book, Horsemen of the Trumpocalypse. I love that title, which you, in which you catalog the various awful people who comprise the Trump administration. Your new book does something very similar in that it presents profiles of 18 individuals or in some cases companies that um, have exacerbated and perpetuated the coronavirus uh, crisis and provides thumbnails of that. Um, and it has a mission of achieving accountability for the individuals who so badly bungled our response to this crisis and who are responsible for so much unnecessary suffering. Um, you set up the point of your book very well. And I was going to read from your book, but it occurs to me, you're right here. Maybe you should read from your book, the paragraph that uh, I pointed out to you on page eight from your introduction, which kind of outlays, outlines uh, what you're attempting to do. Well, I appreciate the setup there, and I'll, I will read in a moment. I do want to uh, thank people for joining us tonight. And I also especially want to thank 
uh, the Progressive Magazine, which I've been associated with very proudly for uh, about uh, 25 to 30 years now, and and I really love the magazine and love what what Bill and Norm and other folks have done with it over the years. What Ruth Conniff uh, did when she was editor, and what Matt Rothschild did. So great honor to be with you. Uh, also a great honor to be uh, doing something with a room of one's own on this book tour. Uh, we're doing all of our events with uh, independent activist groups and independent bookstores. And we're really passionate about making sure that uh, independent bookstores are strong and supported. And so I, I would hope that people would want to buy the book. Uh, and if you do, I really encourage you to buy it from an independent bookstore, especially tonight from room of one's own. So, with that said, um, I will uh, take Bill's cue. And uh, the first chapter of the book, uh, it, it, as Bill said, it, each chapter deals with an individual who uh, did us wrong during the pandemic, who, who failed us uh, either in a position of power politically or economically. Uh, and in each case, I try to set it up by talking about um, individuals who uh, suffered or and in most cases died because of a failure on the part of their government or on the part of their economic system. This is a chapter about Mike Briggs, or I'm sorry, uh, Mike Jackson, a guy who worked for Briggs and Stratton in Milwaukee, uh, who did die. And uh, the section Bill asked me to read is very short. Uh, this book names names and describes crimes, conspiracies, and corruptions. It rejects the claims of the apologists and revisionists who would have us believe that the pandemic was the healthcare equivalent of a natural disaster. That would have gone badly no matter who was in charge. It argues that during the period from early 2020 to early 2021, choices were made, decisions were taken, lies were told that cost not a few lives, but hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lives that did not need to be lost. It does not pretend to present an encyclopedic list of all the wrongdoers. Rather, it presents examples of the kinds of wrongdoing that occurred with the purpose of steering the discussion in its concluding chapters toward a recognition of why holding to account those who failed us in a time of crisis is the only way to assure that the next crisis will not see a repeat of their infamy. Yeah, that's excellent. This is a really interesting concept for a book. It's very well executed. What I would like to do is to go through uh, your list of coronavirus criminals and pandemic profiteers um, as I read the book, I was struck by the fact that while all of these people did terrible, bad things, they did it for very different reasons. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I, I tried to attach like a single word or as few words as possible uh, to explain the motivation uh, or the driving force behind each of the people who are uh, called to task in this book. So I'm going to say their name and you tell us a few lines about it and I'll I'll tell you what I, I summed it up as being the, the key ingredient of their badness, starting with, of course, Donald Trump. Well, Trump gets the first chapter as uh, I suppose he will out of any history of this time. And uh, what I argue in this chapter, which begins with looking at uh, Mike Jackson, who died, is that Donald Trump could have saved immense numbers of lives. Uh, he chose not to do so because he felt that the pandemic was a threat to his reelection campaign. And so he put his own political advantage ahead of human life in this case. Uh, and we know from the Lancet study that uh, in that year from when pa the pandemic hit to when Trump left office, uh, the United States had a circumstance where roughly 40% of the deaths were unnecessary. And so if we say that Donald Trump was in charge and his administration played the critical role in defining the moment, uh, we're talking about a man whose political choices caused hundreds of thousands of people to die unnecessarily. And my summation of the motivation, malice. Mm -hmm. Vice President Mike Pence is up next. Vice President Mike Pence was uh, a person who was put in a position where he could have done an immense amount to steer the administration the right way. He was in charge of the coronavirus task force. He also was seen, you know, I think wrongly, as the adult in the room when Donald Trump and others were there. And yet, instead of standing up to Trump where it was necessary and possible 
and also using his role as chair of that of that uh, section of the, the White House that was dealing with the pandemic uh, to steer things in the right direction, he uh, engaged in many of the same lies that Trump engaged in. And in fact, in the chapter, I focus on how he literally tried to deny the second surge of the pandemic at a point when that denial caused immense damage. And he did it always in service of Donald Trump. And his motive, spinelessness. Yes. <laughs> Number three, presidential son-in-law, Jared Kushner. I'll sum it up very quickly. Uh, if you're in a difficult situation, never put Jared Kushner in charge of the supply chain. Uh, mm -hmm. President Trump always turned to Kushner to do uh, things that were difficult, but Kushner was never up to the task. And in the case of his management of the supply chain through something called Operation Airbridge, uh, he literally caused a problem to become worse in many circumstances. And he did so because he wanted to steer money to the uh, private sector, particularly to interests that, that he and his family had long been associated with. And the one core reality I will tell you about this is uh, the person he turned to for advice on how to manage the supply chain uh, for life and death goods in the midst of a pandemic was a college roommate. My summation of uh, Kushner's driving force, incompetence. Yes. Number four, Mark Meadows, Trump's, I believe, fourth chief of staff. Well, yeah, and we Wisconsinites will always uh, miss Reince Priebus in that <laughs> role. But uh, now Mark Meadows played a really, a, a really devastating role in this, and I write a lot about it. Uh, at a certain point early on, members of the Trump administration had figured out that uh, we needed a national mask mandate, that it would play a critical role in slowing down the spread of the pandemic. And they actually got key members of the administration to talk to Trump to intervene with him. They even brought in a pollster to try and make the argument that Republicans, according to polling data, were supportive of a mask mandate and would accept it if President uh, Trump's uh, endorsed it and encouraged it. And it was Meadows who argued Trump away from that position and said, no, you can't do that. It'll harm us with the base of the party. And so he put ideology ahead and, and political positioning ahead of saving literally hundreds of thousands of lives and preventing millions of infections. And that was my summation, ideology. Yep. Mike Pompeo, Secretary of State. Mike Pompeo wanted to refight the Cold War rather than fight a pandemic. And so he became obsessed with uh, the fact that Cuba was sending doctors to countries that were in a crisis and literally tried to use the power of the United States to uh, discourage those countries from accepting Cuban doctors. He also messed up our relations with the WHO and other agencies in the midst of a pandemic. He literally, at every stage, put uh, ideology and Cold War politics ahead of public health. I said cronyism for him. You talk a bit about how, yeah. you know, he would have his, his fidelity to the agenda of the Koch brothers and such. It would, it would not let them down. Yeah, um, I, think that, I think cronyism is a fair, although in fairness, Bill, uh, I think cronyism would fit with just about every chapter in this book. <laughs> That's probably true. Education Secretary Betsy DeVos. Uh, Betsy DeVos uh, was unable to separate her role that she was in, a very critical role of, of uh, being education secretary in the midst of a pandemic that shut our schools, from her personal obsession with privatization of public education. And so at a point where the uh, public schools were talking about how best to reopen and unions were offering to work with uh, the Department of Education and with the states to do so, she instead went on Tucker Carlson's show and said, well, you know, if they don't want to reopen the way I want them to, then maybe we should take the money away from the public schools and give it to private schools that will do what we tell them to do. So she put her personal agenda ahead of a smooth and smart reopening of public schools. And I indict her for heedlessness. Totally. Um, <laughs> Elaine Chan, our transportation secretary. Elaine Chow. Yes. Chow, excuse me. Uh, well, mm -hmm. uh, the, and, and of course, she got her job uh, the old fashioned way. She's married to Sh McConnell. And, uh, and in that role, as she has in every role that she's had uh, uh, in previous administrations, she screwed everything up. But in the case of, of this administration at this time, 
I, I write, as I mentioned before, in every chapter about people who died, individuals who died in communities across this country because federal officials didn't intervene on their behalf and do the things that should have been done. Bus drivers, flight attendants, uh, subway workers across this country, individually and through their unions, begged with Elaine Chow to issue a national mass mandate for public transportation and to take other actions to protect people who worked on and used public transportation. She refused to do so throughout the entire first year of the pandemic. And uh, the second she left, as soon as she was gone and Joe Biden came in, they issued that mass mandate. But Chow refused to do so. And in the book, I detail how hundreds of bus drivers and uh, subway workers and flight attendants and other public transportation workers died and countless numbers of, of passengers died because she refused to intervene at a critical time to protect them. Yeah, I peg Elaine Chow for pigheadedness for exactly that. She was told every which way that she needed to do, think, do things to save lives and she would not do it. That's right. Next up, Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Well, it's interesting that he would follow Elaine Chow. Uh, and look, Mitch McConnell's uh, intervention in this, and there were many uh, bad interventions, but the incredible thing was that in the spring of 2020, a bipartisan coalition passed the second pandemic relief bill. It was critical for uh, keeping local governments functioning, keeping hospitals working, doing all sorts of vital interventions at a point when uh, getting the government ahead of this thing was very, very critical. And incredibly, Mitch McConnell held up that piece of bipartisan legislation because it didn't include a liability shield for multinational corporations to absolve them of blame even when people died because of their failures. And finally, he had to back down on that, but he delayed relief for the American people literally for months uh, in the midst of a pandemic because he wanted to serve multinational corporations rather than to save lives. Yeah, corporatism, his, his yeah. affinity for corporatism. Um, Senator Rand Paul. Yeah, Senator Rand Paul is, uh, look, he, the ugliness of his approach to this is just almost indefensible. Uh, every time that Dr. Fauci or experts came before um, the committee on which Paul served, he would attack them. And, and it's okay to, to challenge uh, experts and to challenge uh, medical personnel in a situation like this. That's fine to have the discourse, but his attacks were so personal, so vicious, and invariably so wrong that you wondered why he was doing it, especially as a doctor himself. And then of course, you just had to go to his webpage and notice that every time he did one of these attacks, he issued a fundraising appeal. And the fact of the matter is that Rand Paul used his platform in the Senate to attack public health initiatives and public health experts uh, for pure political purposes, particularly for fundraising. Uh, it was about as ugly as you can get as a U.S. Senator. Yeah, my word for him is ignorance. Yes. And he's, well, he's he was, probably the ignorant. The weird part is he's not, he shouldn't be ignorant. I mean, he's the one guy who's, who's there, uh, you know, sitting on that panel who, who did the Hippocratic Oath. Uh, he, should, he should do no harm, but in fact, he did a lot of harm. Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson, who you just wrote about a uh, uh, fine story uh, in The Progressive a few months back, as well as a, a very good editorial in yesterday's uh, Wisconsin State Journal. Well, uh, Ron Johnson is a gift that, that uh, never <laughs> stops giving for working journalists. Um, he's a conspiracy theorist. And I know a moment ago I said uh, that Rand Paul is about as bad an example as you can get of a U.S. senator. But the truth is, Ron Johnson plums the depths. Uh, he spread misinformation. He has amplified uh, skepticism about a pandemic, how to respond to a pandemic uh, at a point when he could do a lot of good. Uh, the, the reality is that he really is ignorant. Um, I'm quite sure of that, but uh, he's the worst sort of ignorant figure. He's a belligerent ignorant. He's angrily ignorant and aggressive in his promotion of it. And there, I would argue there's probably no one in Congress who's done more to promote skepticism about using vaccines and about public health interventions during this crisis. Yeah, I pushed him right past ignorance into stupidity. Oh, well, you're crueler than I, Bill. <laughs> South Dakota Governor Christy Noem. Oh, she's a, she's a real case. Um, I write a lot about her in the book because 
Uh, she clearly would like to be the Republican nominee for president in uh, 2024. Uh, if Donald Trump gets out of the way, I don't think Trump will get out of the way. And so to be the nominee, she's got to be a worse person than Ron DeSantis from Florida. And what I detail is how uh, she literally celebrated the fact that her state refused to protect people in the early stages of the pandemic. Now, remember, South Dakota has meatpacking plants and meatpacking plants were some of the places where you had, saw some of the worst additional uh, initial hotspots for the pandemic. And so I write about immigrant workers in those plants who died uh, because their governor and their state refused to intervene on their behalf. I also write about how she promoted uh, having the Sturgis motorcycle uh, gathering in the midst of the first year of the pandemic, saying that um, you shouldn't get in the way of, of this happening and how within a matter of weeks, they traced a spread of the virus throughout the Midwest uh, back to people who had gone to Sturgis. Uh, she simply, it, she was celebratory in her refusal to protect public health. And it was a really ugly part of her story. Yeah, I paid her with recklessness. Truly reckless, but but deliberately reckless. Deliberately reckless. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis, or Death Santis, as he's been called. Well, Ron DeSantis, uh, look, he's a hypocrite and a cynic uh, and somebody who has clearly tried to use the pandemic as a political tool to advance himself, right? Because on the right, this this skepticism about how to respond to it is, is considered to be a touchstone if you want to run for president. And one of the things I focus on with DeSantis, in addition to uh, his very reckless efforts to open the public schools at too early a point in, in Florida, was his uh, bizarre refusal to let people at the grassroots intervene on behalf of, of public health. And so to a even greater extent than the Wisconsin legislature and the Wisconsin Supreme Court. In Florida, Ron DeSantis uh, punished and attacked local school boards and local governments that tried to do mass mandates, that have tried to, you know, in, in all sorts of ways to intervene on behalf of public health. No governor in the country has so aggressively sought to undermine public health initiatives as Ron DeSantis, uh, an incredibly bad player who for some reason thinks that he can parlay this into a presidential race and who, in fact, at critical points when there are surges in the disease, in the virus in Florida, uh, newspapers in Florida couldn't find him. And then they looked around and they saw, oh, he's giving a speech in some uh, first caucus or first primary state or to some Republican grouping. I mean, he clearly has put his presidential ambitions ahead of public health. Yeah, I put his motivation as opportunism. Totally. And New York, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo? Incredibly bad player. Um, look, Cuomo uh, became sort of a hero uh, to a lot of people in the early stages because he did communicate a lot of information. And frankly, a lot of people saw him as an alternative to Trump. But at the same time, he made terrible decisions uh, in the interest of protecting hospitals and nursing homes uh, and trying to prevent liability for them, doing the same sort of liability shield stuff that Mitch McConnell did. He also made orders for moving people into nursing homes who were COVID positive, which caused spread of the disease in nursing homes. And then most importantly, because people did make mistakes and I'm not about punishing people just who made mistakes. I understand that in a crisis that can happen, but with Cuomo, he lied about it and he threatened to punish people who exposed uh, what he had done as regards the nursing homes, a very, very bad player. And actually someone who in their efforts to cover up their wrongdoing, perpetuated that wrongdoing. And my word for his wrongdoing was dishonesty. True, truly dishonest. Supreme Court, Wisconsin Supreme Court, Justice Rebecca Bradley. <laughs> uh, Rebecca Bradley, uh, and there's a million things you could talk about with her, but her most famous in incident was that uh, in, the, in a debate about uh, public health protections, mass mandates and things of that nature in Wisconsin, uh, before the court, she suggested that asking people to wear masks and, and such and, and following some public health mandates was the same as what was done to the Japanese who were interned during World War II. And uh, the incredible thing was she was called out immediately by Japanese American groups who said there's, there's no comparison. This is those people had their businesses taken away, their livelihoods taken away, and they were forced into uh, you know, internment camps. You know, hundreds of miles from their homes. It was an incredibly devastating thing. 
And yet she stuck to it and kept defending this line, even in decisions issued in Wisconsin. I closed the chapter with uh, the, the guy who played Mr. Sulu on Star Trek, uh, who uh, said, you know, look, I, I was a, a victim of that, that discrimination against the Japanese. And I can tell you, there's no comparison. Uh, you know, people were put into internment camps. And as he said, he was sitting at home watching Netflix. And, and so Rebecca Bradley really did, uh, not only was she on the wrong side of the issue, she was uh, belligerently and aggressively ignorant and cruel. She actually made a bad situation worse by her stretch for a, uh, a metaphor or comparison that was simply absurd. Yeah, I latched on to her comparison with the Japanese internment camps and pegged her with delusion. Delusion is a good one. Former Clinton administration official and Chicago mayor, Rahm Emanuel. Yeah, another Democrat who did bad in this thing. Rahm Emanuel was always obsessed with free trade. And one of the things that became clear early in the pandemic was that our free trade policies in the 1990s and the 2000s and beyond uh, had offshored essential industries, unlike other countries, that plan for the future and plan to make sure that they have uh, industries that can pr protect them and prepare the goods that they would need in an emergency situation. The U.S. didn't have that. And there's no one who advocated more aggressively and frankly, more cruelly for uh, a free trade agenda than Rahm Emanuel. And as I say in the book, you can't simply say Republicans were the problem on this thing. There were Democrats uh, who made steps that along the way made this situation worse. In Rahm Emanuel's case, it was a long-term policy that ended up uh, blowing up on us when the pandemic hit. We simply didn't have uh, the manufacturing capacity to do the things that needed to be done. Yeah, I picked him with free trade absolutism. Yep. The pharmaceutical giant Pfizer. Yeah, I noticed we had a question on the side about uh, Pfizer. And I focus on Pfizer, uh, not because the other pharmaceutical companies uh, weren't, it haven't been bad players. But Pfizer really stood out. They they tried to opt out of some of the basic requirements uh, so that they could actually run their profits up higher. Uh, they rushed a vaccine to the market, which I think a lot of people were excited about at the time. But the the thing to understand is that they did so in ways that that made their profit margin greater than the other companies, and also with an effort to lock in their contracts so that they would be ahead of the curve on making money. They put profit ahead of, uh, of good science and of good, uh, brand, frankly, good public policy. And, and the interesting thing about it is I'm double vaccinated. I've got a booster shot. I'll get another booster shot. Uh, I am not a critic of the vaccines in any way, but I am a critic of the way that the vaccine companies have sought uh, to profit so obscenely off this. And one recent study suggested that Pfizer, Moderna, and their partners are making $1,000 a second, banking $65,000 a minute, $93 million a day, every day, and yet they refuse to cooperate with efforts to uh, make sure that vaccines are available to countries around the world. They are incredibly bad players who should be called to account by their government. This was an easy one, agreed. This, yes. uh, it was this chapter that the progressive excerpts in its current issue, the, the chapter about Pfizer, and we'll talk more about that in a, a, a moment. We're almost through here. Those of you who are white knuckling this, um, just a couple, just a couple more. A longtime Republican operative, Grover Norquist. Yeah, Grover Norquist is a simple one to talk about. Um, he's a guy who said at one point he wanted to shrink the government down. Uh, so small that you could uh, drown it in a bathtub, right? You know, he's this incredible anti-government guy who always told us how bad government was. And yet, uh, when the pandemic hit, guess who was first in line for government aid? Grover Norquist. Mm. And in fact, hypocrisy. Thank you, huge check. Yes, hypocrisy is <laughs> for hypocrisy's word. And finally, Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos. Sure. Jeff Bezos uh, is uh, both a bad player in and of himself, but also a bad player as a stand-in for billionaires in general. Uh, at the start of the pandemic, uh, Amazon fired whistleblowers who said that uh, their plants were dangerous and who pointed out that people were getting sick and, and even dying in the plants. Uh, that was a terrible response to it. As the pandemic went on, Bezos and 
and his company uh, bought unionization because they didn't want uh, to have unions in their plants, even though we know that unions played a critical role in, in protecting workers at, at uh, stages throughout the pandemic and continue to do so. But finally, it's important to understand that Jeff Bezos made unimaginable amounts of money uh, during this period, as did other billionaires. At the beginning of the pandemic, billionaires uh, in the United States controlled roughly $3 trillion. At the end of the pandemic, it was $5 trillion. One of the most exponential growths in the wealth of, of our, our elites, and also one of the most extreme transfers of wealth from the working class, working poor, to the already wealthy. Uh, and what I argue in the book and what I continue to argue uh, in conversations like this is that that's just unacceptable. When we ask nurses to put masks on and go into hospitals, when we ask bus drivers to drive buses, when we ask all these other essential workers to risk their lives, literally to keep our, our healthcare system going and our government functioning and our, our society functioning, uh, these billionaires retreated to their private villas on, on the ocean front or to their country homes moved money around and came out dramatically ahead. They did not share in the sacrifice. And I use Bezos as an example of that because he had the audacity in the midst of the pandemic to uh, fly off into outer space. Yeah, I coined a new word for Jeff Bezos, billionaireism. Yes. Which I really think ought to be recognized as a kind of malady because the reason that he didn't provide basic safety measures for his employees is he didn't want to spend the money. Because no matter how many billions of dollars Jeff Bezos have, no matter how many billions of dollars you can imagine, it will never be enough. He will That's never right. reach a point where he is satisfied with how much money he has. Poor guy. <laughs> Well, Bill, that was that was a you're the first person to do that, where we went through all the different players in the book. And um, and I appreciate it because, uh, you know, usually when we talk about the book, we focus on, you know, a couple of individuals and people move generally very quickly to Trump. Uh, that's not surprising to Bezos and, and a couple others. But it is important to understand that the point of my book is that we have a systemic problem. When a crisis hits, uh, we have had so much impunity for so long in our political and economic elites that uh, they don't see a, a crisis, even a healthcare crisis, as a time to rally to the common good. They see it as a time to advance their political interest and to improve their economic position. And uh, so I appreciate you taking us through some of the different examples of how they did it. So we all know that books are written ahead of the time that they're published. If you had to do it again, is there anybody you would add to this list? Oh, sure. I mean, there's people pop up all the time. And I think, you know, I have a chapter on Pfizer. I probably would add a chapter on Moderna uh, because they there's more and more evidence that uh, they, they have not been particularly good players in this. I also look, um, I think the Biden administration has done a much better job than the Trump administration. I, I you know, we'll say that in, in any situation, any setting. But the fact of the matter is, I do think that that uh, I'd probably look a little bit at the Biden administration's uh, failure to keep its eye on the prize as uh, this pandemic has, resur has been resurgent. And frankly, I, I would like them to be much tougher on the pharmaceutical companies to uh, put a much uh, tougher pressure on them I also frankly believe that we should have a billionaire tax and I would probably do a couple more chapters on billionaires, have an Elon Musk uh, chapter, if you will. And I'd probably uh, spend a little more time than I do. I do spend some time on it in the book, but spend some more time on, on figuring out just how much I want to claw back from the billionaires. I'm debating whether we should ask for the 95% rate that Franklin Roosevelt had during uh, World War II or whether we should just go to 100% and say, that we should take back all the money they made from the day the pandemic uh, began until now. Yeah, you mentioned this as we went through that there are just a couple of Democrats in your mix of villains mm -hmm. here, uh, Rahm Emanuel and Andrew Cuomo. Uh, and I think even without the fact that the Trump administration was in power as the uh, pandemic hit, you would see in any accounting of uh, the response to COVID more bad players on the Republican side than on the Democratic side. And I just want you to, to expound on why that is. What is it about the parties that makes one um, better in terms of its ability to respond in a sane and uh, competent 
way to a, uh, a crisis and the other one to just go nuts and, and cause unnecessary harm? That's a very good question, Bill. It wouldn't have been that way in the past. Uh, it's, it's a good argument. A good argument could be made that uh, as late as the 1950s, even into the 1960s, the Republican Party was more the party of science than the Democrats. And that the Republican Party was probably more likely uh, to uh, respond in, in wise and, and appropriate ways. But what has happened in the Republican Party in the last 40 years has been that it's become obsessed with the idea of, uh, of selling a, a, a take on how to do things that suggests that the market has the answers. Uh, of course, they're always lying, right? They don't believe in the market. They believe in using government as a tool to redistribute wealth upwards. But they, they peddled this lie that uh, government can't do things well, uh, that the market can. And so I, I think they've actually, many of them have actually have taken that in, that they actually believe it. But others, whether they believe it or not, always do see uh, government as, as something to be kind of pushed out of the way so that you can clear the way for corporations and wealthy people to be advantaged. So I think that's a big part of it. But I will tell you that uh, in, in many of my books, I, I reference a, a, a book by John Dean, the former White House counsel, uh, Conservatives Without Conscience. And what he argues is that the modern conservative movement has uh, really uh, moved toward a place where it, it replaces conscience with impunity. And, and it does suggest that uh, when you get power, you use it to advantage yourself politically or economically or in other ways. And I do think there's some, there's some element to that. But I'm always very careful, Bill, about uh, simply blaming one party over the other. Because the fact of the matter is that in covering politics for a very long time, I've seen plenty of Democrats do wrong. And the truth of the matter is, if we talk about those supply chain issues, uh, there's simply no question that Bill Clinton's uh, support for free trade and that the support for free trade by a lot of other Democrats in the 1990s and the 2000s at a time when they could have erected barriers to it and done the right thing, uh, created a lot of the, the underpinnings of the challenge we have. Democrats have too frequently bent to a Republican Party that has become incredibly cruel and destructive. And so uh, I've got a little bit of criticism for both parties. Yeah, as the editor of a publication that was founded by a Republican, I concur with your sentiment there. I want to explore this uh, dichotomy that you create, and you explore at some length in the final chapter of the book between impunity, as you've mentioned, and accountability. Mm -hmm. um, you write about Ferdinand Pecora, a Manhattan prosecutor who oversaw an inquiry into the causes of the stock market crash of 1929 as, as being a kind of example of accountability. In the case of coronavirus criminals and pandemic profiteers, what does accountability look like? That's a great question, Bill. I appreciate it. Um, first off, you know, this distinction between impunity and accountability uh, is important to understand because if you have accountability over time, generation after generation, then impunity doesn't set in. But if you don't have accountability, then those who come to power uh, politically and who are in economically powerful positions feel that they can do whatever they want. They don't feel a sense of uh, concern that they will ever be held to account. And so uh, a lack of accountability creates a worse situation over time. It builds up. And so we need an accountability moment uh, not merely because of what happened during the pandemic, although that's a moral duty, but we also need an accountability moment because as a society, we, we should have had that intervention long ago. I mean, Richard Nixon should not have been allowed to fly back to San Clemente and avoid an impeachment and, and conviction for Watergate. Ronald Reagan should not have been let off the hook for Iran-Contra. George Bush, George W. Bush and Dick Cheney shouldn't have been let off the hook for the Iraq war and for policies that crash, helped to crash the global economy. But they were. We let people walk away even after they have done immense wrong in America. That has happened again and again. So we need an accountability moment. And what I would argue is that accountability can take many different forms. It can uh, involve criminal, civil, and congressional action. There's simply no question of that. And I write about that in the PCORA Commission section of the book, that during Roosevelt's administration, they brought in a, a lawyer who had prosecuted mobsters 
to go after the bankers and the financial players who had made the depression worse. And they actually identified and cracked down on hundreds of bankers and others. There was much more accountability in those days. And that accountability drove the policy changes of the New Deal era, especially as regards banking. We need a similar congressional intervention. We need similar approaches. But there's more to it than that. Accountability can also take the form of taxation. As I've said before in this conversation, I argue that the billionaires who exponentially expanded their wealth should be taxed. They should face, as Bernie Sanders has suggested, at least a one-time tax that brings back a huge portion of what they took out of the economy and, and put into their bank accounts. I also think that Roosevelt was right about excess profit taxes. And the fact is that corporations that have, have benefited exponentially much during this, uh, this pandemic should face a, a form of taxation that brings that money back into uh, the public sector where it belongs. Uh, finally, Bill, it's the court of public opinion. And I write a lot about this. The fact of the matter is I wrote the book because I want people to remember these names. I want people to be disqualified in the eyes of, of uh, you know, I want individuals and corporations to be disqualified in the eyes of the American public uh, so that, that they can't come back and do this to us again. And the fact is that that's one of the great dangers, Bill, that um, because we live in such an instantaneous moment where things move so quickly, we forget uh, that people did us great harm and many people get repositioned. It's amazing to me that George W. Bush is now seen as sort of this congenial good guy uh, who shares chocolate with Michelle Obama. Well, the fact of the matter is he led us into an illegal and immoral war. He did tax policies that certainly played a role in making the economic meltdown of 2007 and 2008 worse. Uh, he was never held to account. If we don't held, hold the coronavirus criminals and pandemic profiteers to account, I promise you, we will find ourselves in a situation in none too many years where things will be dramatically worse and bad players will be making our lives more vulnerable and causing more death and grief and sorrow. I certainly hope we didn't lose Bill there. Norm, I, think I can't lost, hear you. I think we just lost Bill, but uh, hopefully he'll come back in a moment. But let's uh, let's he go was, to questions. Nor, he was shocked. He was shocked by my my uh, my <laughs> hardcore crackdown on the rich and powerful. I think not. Let's let's go to some of the of questions course. that have been coming in, and we have um, a couple of questions about vaccines. One is um, from uh, Stephen, who, uh, let me just find that one here for a second, asks um, in particular about uh, uh, Peter Hotez and the idea of making a vaccine that's uh, uh, effective and, and available worldwide without yeah. a patent so it could be yeah. uh, manufactured and distributed. And, and someone else also asked um, about vaccines from other countries. Uh, Keith asked about the Cuban sure. vaccines, the uh, Chinese and Russian vaccines. So sure. talk about those other models of how to respond to this crisis. Well, that's a great question. I, I'd be glad to spend uh, hours talking about it. I won't, I won't go too far into it, uh, but I've been dealing with this a lot. Look, one of the big problems in, in this crisis is that we, we, it's a good thing. We had a sharing of information of a lot of the DNA information and other, other details that allowed us to develop back. Norm, I hope you didn't just wait there for me. Did you ask a question or two? No, Bill, we're, we're, we're going on the questions now. So. Good. Okay. So okay. I, Sorry I, about that. I go ahead. Um, are, are you, I, I'd said you were shocked by my, uh, by how rough I was <laughs> on the rich and powerful. Uh, and, and I, had to leave, but I suspecting that's not true. I think your prescription for, for uh, uh, accountability are great. I, the thing I kept thinking of is whether there should be some sort of truth and reconciliation commission, some official body not that reconciliation. will- oh, Not reconciliation. I, I, I'm opposed to reconciliation. Uh, truth I'm for, but I, I want accountability. And and so I want a I want the same thing that Roosevelt did with the PCORA Commission, and that is, and, and the, the people in the Senate didn't at that time. I want to see the bad players called before public hearings. I want them to be uh, grilled, and I want the evidence of their wrongdoing to be held against them. I, I 
am not particularly excited about reconciliation. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't want to be a mean person here. But uh, the fact of the matter is we've got, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who died unnecessarily. We have millions of people who got sick unnecessarily. We have tens of millions of people who went through economic hardship and continue to do so. And it just seems to me that at that point, uh, I, I would love to have a truth commission, uh, but I would love to have truth and accountability. And that accountability does, to my mind, involve taxation uh, and where, where potentially it would exist, criminal, civil, and congressional action. Um, so, Do you think there, so, that there is a possibility of, of civil action against some of these players, that they will be subject to lawsuits from people who suffered arguably unnecessary because of the inactions? Uh, yeah, their I, actions look, the and inactions? Fact, I, look, the fact of the matter is that uh, McConnell didn't get his uh, liability shield. And so... There is there is space uh, for at least some action there, which I would favor. Um, also, look, I, I I argue in the book that you know while I complete as you know, Bill, I, there's nobody who's more excited about uh, impeachments than I am, and that that there's no question that uh, Donald Trump deserved both of the impeachments he got. Uh, I think that there there should be congressional action uh, as regards the the incredible wrongdoing related to the pandemic. And uh, I always, as a historian of impeachment, will remind you that you can impeach someone who is out of office if they accept the benefits of that office, and that includes their pension and secret service protection. So we can still go after Trump, and I would not mind that at all. I would love to see uh, that truth, that truth seeking. But I do want to uh, go ahead, Bill. I apologize. You know, I just I, want to I, make a plug for your book, The Genius of Impeachment. I think it's it's a wonderful book, and an important book. And it was written before the impeachments of uh, Donald Trump, but it, its relevance is, is, is to the present moment. You're very kind, and I appreciate that. It makes, it makes a fine Valentine's gift. Um, <laughs> but uh, Norm had put a question about vaccines on, and I, let me quickly finish that answer that I was in the midst of. And, and it was a very, very good question. One of the things to understand is the, the pharmaceutical companies would want, us to under, would want us to imagine that they came up with these answers themselves. They didn't. Pharmaceutical companies don't like to do vaccines. They like to do drugs that you have to take every day for the rest of your life. And, and that's, that's where they make their, have historically made their big money. So they extracted all sorts of, of concessions and benefits from government in the process of this it, making the vaccines that they did. I'm glad they got the vaccines out. That's fine. But the fact of the matter is they should not have exclusivity on this. They've already made exponential profits, epic profits off, off these vaccines. And so I am very, very sympathetic to any step that Lori Wallach and others have argued for that gets rid of the intellectual property protections, that gets these vaccines out and gets this information out. And one of the questioners asked about alternative vaccines, other types of vaccines, some of which might be uh, more readily available uh, and more easily distributed in countries that have very little level of vaccination at this point. I favor that as long as it's safe, as long as it's responsibly developed. Um, I don't think that there should be uh, limits on the entry. There should be a baseline standard. I don't want anybody to get to be harmed. I don't want anybody to do something irresponsibly, but as long as there is a responsible development of vaccines by Cuba or by uh, you know South Africa or the Indians or anybody around the world, I think that's that's terrific because the fact of the matter is if we're honest about this pandemic, what we will understand is it is a global pandemic. And until we make vac vaccines available globally, and, and affordable at, at, a, at a baseline level, uh, we're not gonna get ahead of this thing. We're not gonna beat this thing and we're certainly not gonna beat the next pandemic. What we need is a, a, a new arrangement as regards vaccines, which some people tried to do at the start of the pandemic, but they were undermined in doing so by leading us back into the book, Mike Pompeo. And, uh, and so again, I appreciate the questions. I could go on about it for hours, but I'll, I'll let, other people ask questions. Yeah. Well, let's let's take off from there with the next question. Um, this from uh, somebody on Facebook. Can you elaborate on how these bad actors undermined the effectiveness of science and evidence-based public health 
uh, advocates and advice. Oh, so there's simply no question of that. In fact, we saw it on a on an almost daily basis in the the absurd uh, public uh, news conferences and briefings that Donald Trump and others did in the first year of the pandemic. And frankly, that we see in Congress even to this day, there was a a, a constant questioning of responsible public health responses. There was a questioning and an undermining of uh, experts on these areas. And in fact, uh, there was an incredible amount of disinformation and misinformation, which we saw not just, you know, in the fringes of the of the Internet, but we saw uh, literally coming from people in positions of power. But there's one final thing I'll say on this. And I write about it in the book. I think this is one of the the least discussed aspects of this. In the early stages of the pandemic, when Donald Trump and Mike Pence and others could have created a coherent, steady stream of information, they instead were chaotic. Some days they would say it was a a crisis if they thought that would somehow benefit them politically. The next day uh, they would say, well, it's almost over. It'll be done by Easter. Uh, There was no steady, coherent message. And it, it basically fed distrust of the government distrust of science, distrust of, you know, proper approaches to this thing. And I will tell you that in doing the book, I interviewed leaders from other countries, including uh, Katrin Jakobsdottir, who is the uh, prime minister of, of Iceland. And, you know, what, what she says about Iceland is, you know, they, they saw this was a serious issue. By the way, they've done incredibly well in dealing with this issue. Uh, they saw it was a serious issue from the start. They moved the doctors and the public health experts out front. They put them out front on a regular basis. And somebody asked her, well, what did you say at all these press conferences? And she said, I, I said, listen to these people. You know, I mean, she she recognized the importance of having a steady, clear message. And we didn't have that in America. And in answer to the person's question, uh, that severely undermined our ability to respond to this pandemic. This question from uh, Michael, who wants to know, what about the Trump campaign rallies? Were they breaking laws about um, COVID restrictions mm-hmm. when they were gathering people together in these huge campaign rallies? And and what about reporting, like the fact that Trump was apparently um, COVID positive when he had the debate with Joe Biden on television? Well, I mean, we, we have revelations upon revelations. This is why... Uh, you know, when Bill asks about, you know, truth and reconciliation or truth or, you know, commissions and investigations, I think there's a lot of investigation that needs to be done. There's simply no question in my mind that within the Trump White House, they lied to us, uh, not just about the severity of the pandemic, but about the president's infection, about, you know, what other people were going through. It was a really, really bad uh, and irresponsible response to these things. Now, one final thing about the, the Trump rallies. I mean, this is sort of the, 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 the greatest tragedy of all. I mean, we lose sight of, of how bad this was. Herman Cain, a former uh, candidate for president of the United States, a, a Republican who was a close ally of Donald Trump, died during, this, during the, the pandemic. And, and apparently, if, if we understand the reports correctly, you know, perhaps from being at a Trump rally. And others did as well. And, and uh, this it is quite clear that throughout this early, the early stages of the pandemic, and even to this day, Donald Trump put his political advantage and his sort of tough guy image ahead of the health and safety of his own supporters. And I mean, that's something that, that we can never lose sight of. And it's, it's one of the most dangerous realities of this moment that when you have a leader who is willing to sacrifice his own supporters uh, in order to, you know, come off with a certain style of image to satisfy a, a certain group of his followers, uh, to satisfy Mark Meadows and others who tell him that, that you know, this is the right thing to do for the base. Uh, these, are, these are people who ought to be held to account. I would love it if, there were, if his own supporters held them to account. But if they don't, then, then certainly as a society and, and in, a, in both political and uh, as well as civil and criminal areas, we ought to we ought to explore that. That that's it's at the end of the day, the more information that comes out about it, I think the more people will come to realize that Donald Trump didn't have their best interests at heart. He never did, and uh, he was only interested in his own reelection and, frankly, his own perpetuation of power.
But that's always been that? obvious. That's always been clear. The to thing you, is, Bill. Trump, <laughs> <laughs> Trump I, has supporters who are willing to be sacrificed. That's right. part of I, the I want to squeeze in a couple last I questions am, here. Uh, one question that we haven't addressed at all, the bad media actors. Who are the yep. bad media actors in all of this, and how did that play into uh, the exacerbation of the pandemic? Sure. I think that's a, that's a fantastic question. As, as people who, who know my background, uh, know that Bob McChesney and I have spent many years writing books about media and, and it's many, many failings. And so it, the reality of media is woven through this whole book. Um, and, and you know, as I noted when talking about De Betsy DeVos, that she went on Tucker Carlson's show to, to talk about, um, you know, how she wanted to move money to the private schools and that. Uh, there's there's no doubt that that there were a lot of bad media players, and, and we often default to the easy ones, to so Fox and right wing talk radio. Right now, we're in the midst of a controversy about Joe Rogan and Spotify as regards vaccine misinformation. But one of the things I, I sought to do in this book was to uh, to recognize the one of the biggest mistakes that media makes, which is that it it always goes to people in power, right? It it celebrates people in power even when they're wrong, and so especially in the early stages of the pandemic, Donald Trump had an incredible platform to spread misinformation and disinformation. It wasn't in the far corners of the internet, right? It wasn't on right-wing talk radio or, or even on Fox. It was, you know, on a regular basis in, in uh, public press conferences and events like that. And so we, we really, media needs to, uh, media outlets need to kind of revisit this and think very seriously about how they deal with this. And I, I, I note, that uh, I listen every day to the BBC. And I'll tell you something, when a, a British political player comes on the BBC and starts lying or spreading misinformation or disinformation, the, the interviewer immediately calls them out, right? They, they don't give them an inch on it. In America, we tend to give people, you know, not an inch, we give them a mile. Uh, and a huge amount of the disinformation and misinformation about the pandemic was spread using you know mainstream media channels by powerful political players. Uh, one final thing I will will suggest in this regard too is that um, you know we as a as a country have a really bad approach to our our big national challenges. We tend to see them as natural disasters rather than as uh, crises that can be made better or worse by those who are in power. And our media uh, too often tends to cover uh, circumstances in that way. And it's only only later on do we have the investigative reporters show up and say, oh, well, they got it wrong. We should be inclined from the beginning to follow the, the what I would call the Naomi Klein rule, which is assume that there are going to be disaster capitalists, assume that you're going to have a shock doctrine moment, and assume from the start that you should be looking for the bad players rather than, you know, kind of stepping back in awe of, you know, the politically powerful. And that, that sort of leads into a question from Linda, which is uh, progressives generally feel that uh, they're fairly well informed about COVID-19 and the pandemic. They pay, they're paying attention to the news. But is there something that you feel that even well-read people among us do not know or understand that you learned while researching this book? Well, that's a fabulous question. And um, look, I, I'll tell you, the, the, the thing that, that amazed me the most in writing the book was something that Bill, in his excellent kind of review of all the, the bad players, brought into play, which was that uh, there was a moment when the Trump administration seriously considered a uh, national mask mandate and considered you know, embracing many of the public health uh, protections that, that uh, they were encouraged to embrace. They chose not to do so for reasons of ideology and politics. But uh, I, I do think that, that that was striking to me is that there was much more going on, you know, behind the scenes. And we, we were closer at times to getting this right than I think some people might have thought. The other thing is that uh, I can't begin to emphasize uh, how much damage uh, Andrew Cuomo and some others did uh, with their approach to nursing homes. And if there's a, a, a deep substory of this pandemic, it is uh, the failure of Democrats and Republicans of our political class and our regulatory class as regards the elderly. We know that this pandemic was something that was most threatening to the elderly. 
uh, it should have been, you know, red alert, you know, mission critical that we, we get on top of the circumstance in nursing homes first and foremost, and we simply didn't do it. And we had immense numbers of people die. I mean, it, so many stories that are almost lost to history, like whole, you know, convents, you know, retirement homes for nuns where, you know, so many of them died, nursing homes with just unbelievable levels of death. And, you know, as I wrote the book, that was that was one of the most heartbreaking realities. One final thing I'll say to Linda, which I think is really important, uh, something that came out again and again in this book, again, as I've mentioned, every chapter or just about every chapter, I've got an individual who died and I track back through their story and find out and try to identify who could have saved their lives, who could have made it possible for them to survive and be with their family today, working today. And um, what was striking to me is I, you know, kind of interviewed people. And as I read back on the reviews of, of many of these deaths was that the people who died initially, working class people, essential workers, often knew that they were in danger. And they often tried to communicate through their unions or individually that where they were working was dangerous, that, that there was something that was wrong there and they weren't listened to. I write about a bus driver who in February of 2020, a bus driver in the Seattle area was saying, look, these buses are unsafe. People are getting on the buses. We don't have screens to protect us. We don't even have masks. And he says, this is, he referred to buses as um, land-based cruise ships, right? Because we knew all these people were dying on the cruise ships. And, and he was saying that before the pandemic even hit its, even hit its first peak. Um, similarly with Mike Jackson, who I write about in the first chapter, he and his coworkers went to management and said, this plant is unsafe, right? And they did not get an appropriate or adequate response. And I guess that's one of the core things that I learned in writing this book is that, that workers knew, they knew how unsafe their circumstances were. They weren't listened to by corporations, by people in power, by the media. And, uh, and if we recognize that, and frankly, if we recognize the need for a much higher level of unionization so we could have better vehicles to amplify worker voices, I think we'd have a, a real counter uh, to a lot of the impunity that exists. So Norm, I think we're, you're muted. Yeah, I'm, I'm there again. We're, we're, I know we're almost out of time here, but we did have somebody who's asked a couple of times about the possible privatization of Medicare. Mm -hmm. And it's not specifically the topic of the book, but, but it's something that comes up regularly. And since seniors uh, are the ones that you mentioned were in many ways uh, among the most affected by this pandemic, is that a, uh, is that a fear? And is it, is sure. it more or less of a fear uh, in the wake of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic? You know, like, I don't think we're going to see the privatization of Medicare or Medicaid uh, in the short term, or at least a full privatization, because it's so incredibly unpopular to do that. Uh, the Ameri it's, it's one of, It really is one of the third rails of American politics. But the chipping away at Medicare, chipping away at Medicaid, the undermining of it, in the same way that Thatcher under, undermined the National Health Service in, in Great Britain in the 1980s, uh, horribly damaging. Uh, you know, she would never have shut the NHS down, but she undermined it on a regular basis. There is simply no question. It is absolutely absurd that Medicare and Medicaid in this country are difficult, that they're complicated, that you have to do, you know, you have to get alter an, an additional insurance policy to cover the barrier there. So we've got a real, real problem in America as regards this. And uh, Bernie Sanders, who I write about a lot in the book, you know, one of the first things that he tried to do with the Build Back Better Act was to extend vision, dental and hearing care uh, to people who are on, on Medicare. That was just that's just logical stuff. I mean, it's it's amazing that you would say to people that those things, you know, that you can't get those things right. you got to pay for that when you know what what if you're if you're a person who's in a difficult situation, or you're an older person, uh, vision, hearing and, and dental, those are pretty vital things. And and so we have a problem in this country. And if there is. When I talk about accountability, the reason that I favor accountability is because, as I said, accountability drives change. And we need to hold people to account and then recognize where the gaps are, where, it may, where it's possible for people to fail us in so many ways. And so one of the core things that I would argue is that uh, if we look seriously at what happened during the pandemic, what we realize is why it went better in so many other countries 
is because they have a national healthcare system with a single payer or some variation on that model. And they also have uh, national retirement and pension systems that take care of the elderly. Uh, we need a, a social welfare net in this country. We need it more now than we ever have. It is desperately needed. The pandemic made that clear. It also made clear that our current system is just shot through with racism, with sexism, with classism that allows people to die because they don't happen to be wealthy white men. And the fact of the matter is, if we start to recognize that, then if we're going to have accountability, real accountability, it isn't just to hold coronavirus criminals and pandemic profiteers to account. It is to recognize that they are part of a system that failed us during this pandemic and that will continue to fail us until we reform it. We're doing this conversation here in Wisconsin, where uh, the Progressive Magazine is based, and John, where you are based as well, and of course our uh, our co-host, Rumblin's Own Bookstore, based here in Madison, Wisconsin, as well. We've had a couple questions about Robin Voss and the Wisconsin State Legislature. I know you they, mentioned they, Rebecca Bradley, you mentioned Ron Johnson, uh, but talk just for a second about um, Robin Voss and Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. Oh, it, Robin Boss doesn't escape mention in the book. Um, look, I am a Wisconsinite, and so there's a reason that, uh, you know, that there's a little more Wisconsin in this book. There's a little more Wisconsin in every book that I write. And uh, yeah, look, Robin Boss was a terrible player and symptomatic of something that we saw around the country. Uh, there were many governors who sought to do good. It's one of the, the realities. And one of the interesting things is that, that it wasn't just Democratic governors who sought to do good. There are Republican governors like Larry Hogan in Maryland, uh, the governor of Vermont, the governor of Massachusetts, Charlie Baker, people who, who basically tried to get this right. And uh, they ran into trouble with their own party. And usually where the trouble would come from was in the state legislatures. And they, there is clearly a reality in our state legislatures across the country that Republican leaders and a lot of Republican legislators across this country sort of became the front line in the pushback against mass mandates, public health interventions, and, and the protections that we needed. And Robin Boss is symptomatic of that. His response to, as I, I do deal with this some in the book, his response to the April election in Wisconsin in 2020, when Tony Evers tried to do what governors across the country did, which is delay the voting and make sure that it could be done via mail rather than in person, was inhuman. What Voss and, and his allies did and what the courts did in backing them up was immoral at every level. That is, it goes way beyond politics. The notion that, that we could have someone in a position of power who would say, well, I'm sorry, people with pre-existing conditions, people who, who are afraid of getting sick, uh, if they want to vote, if they want to participate in our democracy, then they've got to jump through the hoops that I put up for them, including going out and voting in the midst of a pandemic. That's what Robin Voss did. It was absolutely indefensible. And I use him as an example of, you know, frankly, the, the most immoral of our political players. And I would, I would put Voss, you know, right there with Donald Trump when he was lying about the extent of, of the ailment uh, with any DeSantis or anyone else. His, his actions were indefensible and they led to people dying and getting sick and losing economic positions that didn't have to happen. And so I, I would hope that uh, history is not very kind to Mr. Voss. And I, I'm not, as you know, I'm not a particularly mean person. It's not that I want to pick on individuals, but the fact of the matter is that if you don't hold people like Robin Voss and Ron Johnson and others to account, uh, and Democrats as well who did wrong in this, if you don't hold them to account, they or someone else will do this to us again in the future and we just can't afford it. This final comment from Rhonda, uh, who says, thanks for bringing into focus much of what and whom we've suspected and some additional culprits, but how do we counter those people in power who would tend to undermine positive response to the crisis? And that's sort of as perhaps mm -hmm. the summary of, uh, of our conversation today. Yeah, look, uh, the, the way that we counter it is is multifold, but I, I again go back to that concept of, of accountability. If we don't have accountability in this moment, and this is on the Democrats because they currently control the White House and the Congress, 
if we don't have a serious approach to accountability, then those who empower, who are in power, who have failed us, will continue to fail us. They will return to power. They will stay in power. Someone else like them will come to power. Accountability is critical at a regular basis. It is in many cases like a vaccine or like a vaccine booster. If we have regular accountability moments, then those in power will know that they shouldn't undermine public health, that they shouldn't see a crisis as a chance to make money or to help their friends make money or to advance themselves politically. But if we don't have accountability, I promise you, the circumstance will get worse. I always go back to Bruce Coburn, the Canadian folk singer, uh, who had a song during the 1980s. The trouble with normal is it always gets worse. And the bottom line is that unless we intervene with an accountability moment, we will see worse than what we saw during the pandemic. And to me, that's just an unimaginable threat. That's something that we ought to recognize is so severe that, that it's, it is time to have, have those commissions, have those investigations and hold people to account, not merely to punish them, but to set a better course for the future. John, that's a perfect metaphor. I think we shall get vaccinated against coronavirus criminals and pandemic profiteers. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, both so much for joining Thanks, us tonight. John Nichols, the book again, Coronavirus Criminals and Pandemic Profiteers. You can get a copy uh, signed by John with a mm -hmm. donation to the Progressive Magazine at progressive.org slash book hyphen event. And uh, you can also get it at your local independent bookstore. And I want to thank uh, Arum One's Own Books here in Madison for co-sponsoring this event uh, for us tonight. And of course, independent bookstores across the country that have been hosting events like this with John Nichols. Um, Bill Leader's editor of the Progressive Magazine, which again, ha Bill has the, uh, the cover story in this issue that's just going out in the mail right now. So you should be uh, seeing it uh, in your mailbox if you're a subscriber. If you're not a subscriber, go to progressive.org slash subscribe and uh, you can remedy that very quickly. And uh, thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Norm, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate it. Let me let me quickly thank Bill for, uh, as always, the best interview and recommend Bill's recent article, that it, the cover story in the magazine, which is classic, great investigative journalism. Absolutely what we need and and. Uh, and so important. And let me thank you, Norm, for always putting these things together. And above all, everybody for these great questions. I'm honored uh, that people are interested in these issues. And I promise you, uh, I am not letting go of this. To me, uh, this is something I'll be talking about for a long time into the future, because the fact of the matter is, I don't want those who died as a result of this pandemic to have died in vain. I want their memory uh, to, be, to be honored and I think the best way we honor it is with accountability. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you, Thank John. You.